Good evening and welcome. This is a, an expanded version of the South Haven Speaker Series for 2017. In the past, we've done four presentations. We stretched it to five last year, and this year we're moving to six. David Ryden is in his 23rd year as a member of the Hope College Political Science faculty and is currently chair of the department. In that time, he has published numerous books and articles on such topics as the Supreme Court and the electoral process, religious liberty, faith-based sector and governmental partnerships, and other questions faced at the intersection of religion and politics. He is the author of the book, The U.S. Supreme Court and the Electoral Process, and most recently, Is the Good Book Good Enough? Evangelical Perspectives on Public Policy. I can speak from personal experiences as the former Vice President for Public Relations at Hope College that David's expertise in the realm of electoral politics and the Supreme Court has garnered significant national media attention with his insights appearing on CNN, the Christian Science Monitor, US News and World Report, and the New York Times. David received his bachelor's degree from Concordia College, Moorhead, Minnesota, his law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School, and the PhD from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Ryden, who will speak on the topic, the Supreme Court in the Crosshairs. Thanks, Tom. Your homework tonight, three terms. I'm going to give you three terms, listen for them, got to understand them, and then you got to work them into your conversation. All right? You, you know, and if you do this, you will, you will win friends and influence people. Okay? You will impress. I promise you. The three terms, packing the court, okay, packing the court, is Trump packing the court? Term number two, transformative appointment. A transformative appointment. Is Neil Gorsuch a transformative appointment? And then my favorite, the nuclear option. <laughs> yeah. Is the Senate going to go nuclear? All right, packing the court, transformative appointments, the nuclear option. You don't need to remember anything else. If you get that, you're good to go. How big a role did the vacancy on the court play in what happened uh, on November 8, 2016? Would Donald Trump be president if there had not been an opening on the court? Put another way, was the future of the court a salient enough issue to nudge a very close electoral college race in one direction or the other? Historically, the answer is no. Historically, the Supreme Court has simply not been much of an issue in presidential campaigns. Different this year, okay? And I want to just raise kind of two data points to, to argue that this was different. One pre-election, one post-election. Um, and they suggest, I think, that the court was actually of historic significance as an influence on voting uh, November 8. Um, first, the Pew, the Pew Forum, uh, highly regarded survey uh, institution, um, prior to the election, they did a survey um, and uh, the question regarding the court, 65% uh, 60 of uh, respondents classified the court as, quote, very important, unquote, to their vote. Um, this was 20% higher than salience of abortion, 15% higher than people's concern about the environment. It was higher than education, okay? Um, the corollary to that, among Trump supporters, 70% ranked the court very important compared to 62% of Clinton voters. Um, then the, the post-election exit poll surveys, um, they showed that of all voters uh, who, who uh, registered for the exit poll, 21% ranked the United States Supreme Court as very important, with another 50% ranking it as important. important. Uh, here, those who ranked it as very important favored Trump by a 57 to 40% margin. Okay. So 71% ranked it as very important or important. Trump had a 17% differential over Clinton in terms of uh, voters viewing it that way. 
Uh, so when one considers the number of states in the Electoral College where Trump's margin of victory was razor thin, uh, a few thousand votes here or there, it seems likely that the court was a decisive issue in swinging the Electoral College to Donald Trump. The second truism, the court's future depends principally on elections, uh, which determines who will be doing the appointing, namely the president. And all presidents seek to pack the court. Yes, very good. All right. It's a smart group, I can tell. It's a high IQ level here in the room. Yep. Right? All presidents seek to pack the court. Uh, while they may look uh, for impressive credentials, experience, uh, judicial temperament, and the like, their primary criterion is ideological compatibility. Every president packs the court by putting forth justices who share his beliefs and align with his ideological commitment. Um, given the outlook of the presidential race at the time, that President Obama's nominating Garland was actually something I viewed it as something of a peace offering. Uh, he was relatively moderate. He was in his 60s. His tenure would not have been um, as long. He was not a kind of a raving uh, liberal. In other words, he was as good as Republicans were going to get uh, from President Obama. Uh, and they could count on a, 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 a Clinton. If they waited and Clinton got elected, you could pretty much bet your bottom dollar that she was going to pick a more liberal justice. Um, uh, but by making the vacancy on the court an issue electorally, undoubtedly many conservatives who otherwise found Trump appalling and objectionable and who otherwise might have been part of the Never Trump movement felt compelled to cast a grudging vote for him because of the specter of Hillary Clinton filling that opening with a transformative pick. So when one has an evenly divided court and a vacancy, the filling of which may well push it in a leftward or a rightward direction for decades to come, uh, it makes eminent sense from a standpoint of democratic imperatives to leave that to the people. And that's what we had this time. With the court's future direction in doubt, hotly contested races for the presidency, and for majority control of the Senate. And so think about McConnell's decision uh, to sit on the Garland uh, nomination in this light. Uh, if elections are the only point of popular input on the court, uh, and especially if what is at issue is a decisive transformative appointment, uh, it's not only rational, some might say it's compelling. I would come back to the point about the Electoral College, right? That uh, we were, I was talking about it with somebody up here before, um, and I may be in a very small minority that I, I love the Electoral College. Um, oh, I just thought, I thought like, you'd be reaching for your rotten fruit. Um, um, and in part because I think it is far more democratic than uh, a nationwide diffused popular vote. Uh, that what a, an Electoral College vote gives us is actually 50 not one diffused popular vote, but 50 Democratic majorities. Uh, one of the things I like about the Electoral College is it, it elevates minorities. Uh, it gives minorities a voice. Um, oh, absolutely. If we had a 50% plus one vote, you think that would take into account minorities? No, it would be a, a diffused majority. Um, when I talk about more, think about primary season. Think about what happens in primary season when the candidates trudge from state to state to state to state. And every state they go to, they meet different, they meet different majorities. They meet, they go to South Carolina, where it's a large black population. They go to Iowa, where it's largely white. They go up to New Hampshire, where it's all those, right, live free and die types, and so on and so forth. Um, and through that process, Minorities have a voice. And if it were uh, a nationwide vote, uh, I don't think that would happen. Uh, two final thoughts. Um, there was lots of kind of shaking of heads and dismayed looks when I talked about what was lost for the liberals in the crowd on November 8. I want to offer some consolation. Um, and so, so here's one. Um, there, and, and to me, there's an irony um, in uh, embedded in Donald Trump kind of shaping a more conservative court. Uh, and that is a more conservative court may prove to be a blessing in the age of Trump. Um, uh, one of the more legitimate fears of a Trump presidency, in my mind, is that he seems so constituted as to have little regard 
for or even understanding of constitutional limits, uh, especially when it comes to executive authority. Um, and guess what? I mean, starting with Bill Clinton and then George W. Bush and then Barack Obama, they all prepared us for Donald Trump. They all have gradually elevated the use of executive order and now we have the natural fulfillment of that in Trump. Um, but fortunately, conservative justices tend to be more inclined to be deeply skeptical of executive power. Could you expand a little on your thought that the, the, poten the potential justing blessings of a conservative court at the time of Trump, what are the potential blessings you're thinking about? He has already, so yeah, he has already pushed the limits of executive authority. I mean, his use of executive authority the first week of, he was like a kid in a candy store. Oh, look, I got this pen, right? And I can do things just wielding a pen, executive order. Um, right? It's just manic, right? Um, and to me, it's, it is clear, right? It is clear that we will have very quickly uh, questions about con uh, separation of powers and kind of institutional conflicts between the branches of government and the court will be looked upon to resolve those. Um, and uh, historically, historically, at least in the last couple decades, uh, conservative justices have, have been more mindful of that. And been, they've been more inclined to kind of slap down executive authority. This will test, if this happens, this will test my thesis of justices not being partisan. Right, because if they give them a lot of leeway, then I take it back. Right, then they start to look like they're more political actors. Um, I think you can take some heart in looking at Neil Gorsuch and what he said uh, immediately uh, when Trump started kind of taking pot shots at a district judge. Um, yeah, I, I'm encouraged by that. Yep. Uh, on two of your slides, you use the term religious liberty. Yes, and. I'm having trouble with the identification uh, of that in that way because I think those of us who would never again ever step foot in a Hobby Lobby would take issue with the identification, the term religious liberty uh, in that some of us would look at that as imposition of a particular religious uh, philosophy being imposed on everyone else and I think on the you also had it on a slide where you said um, if we had a liberal majority religious liberty would be dealt with and obviously that would be dealt with in another way so I think I think the, the term religious liberty itself is problematic when we're looking at court decisions. What is religious liberty? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, um, I, I, um, we can get down in the weeds on, on sort of jurisprudential tests and standards if you want me to tell you why I disagree with you on how this is an imposition, religious liberty is an imposition on society. Uh, the standard for religious liberty is uh, compelling interest, least restrictive means. It's more complicated, right? The, the federal standard is one standard, uh, and then there are state standards, and then some states have religious freedom restoration acts, which impose other standards. Um, but one standard is if government um, is going to do something uh, that impacts religious, okay, fine. you don't like religious liberty, let's talk about religious practice, let's talk about religious exercise. Uh, that may or may not clarify it for you. Okay, and here's a liberal conservative divide. Okay, in terms of what they, con what they believe constitutes religious free exercise. And there is a general inclination, I'm generalizing, there's a general inclination among liberals to view religious exercise as a private affair. Uh, it's worship, okay? Uh, among conservatives, this is why evangelicals are conservatives, right? There's a tendency to view it as something much more public, okay? And religious free exercise is not limited to the synagogue uh, or the mosque or the church. Uh, that religion and religious convictions are lived out in everything one does, and it's an utterly public affair, 
okay? And so there's a philosophical divide. And you're right, that is a question of sort of definition, right? And, and understanding of what is religion and what is religious practice. Um, but the test, so the test, government doing something to sort of impose restrictions on religious practice or religious liberty or whatever you want to call it. Um, if they have a compelling interest, they are free to do that. <coughs> government needs to establish a compelling interest. Okay? And they need to establish that they have a compelling interest that they are pursuing in the least restrictive means, the least damaging way to religious practice because of our religious tradition, because of religion being the first uh, liberty uh, mentioned in the Bill of Rights, right? It's one we've always elevated in our country. Um, so the, the test is designed to balance competing interests, okay? So if it were something, if it kind of fits your description, right, that this is an imposition of religious viewpoints across society, um, I think that would fail that test. Okay, if government can show it is pursuing something that is a compelling interest and it is pursuing that interest in a, in a way that is reasonably tailored to advance that interest but to do it in ways that are as respectful as possible of the religious practice, um, then that's, that's sort of a good compromise. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I view it differently, uh, pretty strongly actually. Can you comment further on the uh, significance, meaning of the nuclear option? And is it, can you confirm, is it not a procedural matter that is subject to the controlling uh, majority of the respective uh, houses of the legislature? Hence, it can change every two years. Uh, it is a technique that uh, can be used. Uh, I don't see quite how it's uh, involved in the selection of the Supreme Court uh, justice. Right, yeah, it's a Senate rule, right? It's a se so before we, the nuclear, right, the filibuster is a Senate rule, nothing constitutional about it. It's a long-standing uh, Senate rule, Senate tradition. It can be changed every term. Uh, a majority, uh, you, uh, the Senate is free to change it by majority vote. Uh, I would need to think long and hard about whether once it goes away, via the nuclear option that the majority party, the majority of the Senate changes uh, and they come in, I would, I would be hard pressed to think of a kind of a hypothetical or context where they would reinstitute it. Um, that sort of once it's gone, I think the majority party is going to play power politics. Once it's gone, it's gone. That's my Um, but they could have tried to do more to make it a political issue. Um, that would have been there. And they did in spurts. Now, Hillary Clinton, by the end, didn't. I, I think, uh, if you want someone to blame, blame Hillary Clinton. Uh, it was it, just a miserable campaign on this particular issue. Um, Democrats tried to sort of make a, they tried to make some political hay out of it, kind of at, at a couple of different points. Um, how do we get people and politics less polarized? We're only going to go till quarter to nine. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, let, let's make everything not about politics. Would be one, and I, as a political scientist, right? I always kind of find, make myself right. Uh, we politicize everything, um, and so we politicize everything. Everything gets elevated in terms of its uh, consequence. That stokes polarization. Uh, redistricting certainly has given us districts where the only threat to a conservative incumbent is from the right, and the only threat to a liberal incumbent is from Bernie Sanders' territory. So uh, that plays a role. Uh, social media has been awful for our politics. It has given us fake news. It's given us fake dialogue. It's given us moral preening, uh, virtue signaling, uh, and it creates its own set of bubbles where we are only talking to everybody who thinks like us. Um, that, has been, that has been awful for our politics. Um, I would say uh, probably our biggest hope to try to do something in a real tangible way about the polarization is to uh, lower our gaze. Um, and focus on politics and the communities that we can do something about 
which is where we live, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Uh, I think it's hard to really demonize somebody when you're, when you're living across the street or working together to shape your community or your school or your church. Um, I would think that would be a really good first step if people would pay just a heck of a lot less attention to Washington, D.C. Um, and think local and aim one's efforts there. I think that would be a good start. If the constitutionalists are correct that you don't have to act on a nomination and it's tit for tat, doesn't that mean the Supreme Court could actually go out of business? by not having anybody ever approved and as they die off? I suppose, sure, yeah. I mean, some might say, hey, all right. <laughs> um, no, that would never happen, but there, there seemed to be this sense that, oh, horror of horrors, we only have eight judges, eight justices. There's nothing that says we need a full roster of nine. They can do their business as eight. It might, in fact, it might make them uh, strive a little harder for a consensus and compromise. All right, great questions. I appreciate the lively uh, pushback, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is on March 30th, Thursday night, March 30th, right here. Uh, her topic, it's, it's Dr. Jean Norris. Her topic is on the question of, is college the right choice? And uh, you'll see more coming out on that in the next uh, few days and weeks. And we hope to see you at that session as well. 